Hey, it's Matt Sager back after what has admittedly been a pretty long respite from this podcast. Apologies if you miss me. There are several reasons for my extra long absence, and I'll touch on a few of them. The biggest was that, well, if you know much about me, you know that my history is in radio, New York radio. It's where I got my start. I was on K-Rock for several years, then Q104 for several years after that. I've been on Sirius XM, MTV, MTV2, like my roots are in broadcasting and voice acting. Those are my two big claims to fame. I continue to be a working voice actor, and to the extent that there are opportunities out there, I wouldn't turn down working in radio again, doing an air shift of some sort. And that's the opportunity that came my way. Without naming names or companies, I'm not sure I'm supposed to, so it's nothing like oh, it went poorly or anything like that, but a major New York station from like a legacy New York rock station reached out to me thinking that they might relaunch and expressing a desire to have me be a key part of that. And so with a lot of fun, excitement and nostalgia, I got together with old friends and old colleagues, people who've known and worked with me for decades. And we embarked on this project and I don't know whether or not it's going to pan out. If it does, it won't keep me from this podcast again. And if it doesn't, you'll never hear about it again. But anyway, if nothing else, this is an excuse to walk down memory lane and say, hey, why do people care about Matt Sager? Who is he? I was first and foremost, before I was anything else, a big full-time on-air guy at K-Rock and then later some other radio stations. And then I parlayed that into voice acting and now I'm doing a podcast. Anyway, that is a major reason why I've been away from this show for several weeks. Other reasons, just a lot of stuff going on. I'll be honest, I didn't feel terrible about not being able to podcast during that time because, you know, I talk a lot about the comic book industry, major happenings within it, and there hasn't been a ton of good news. There certainly wasn't during those weeks. Like, Valiant closed their headquarters. DC had a massive set of layoffs and firings. People I know, good friends of mine are losing their jobs. And I'm like, oh, I don't feel terrible that I'm not doing a podcast reporting this very sad, disheartening news. I did feel a little bit bad when DC Fandom came and went last week. And DC had a much more successful version of an online con. They did a lot better at it than Comic-Con had done. And they unveiled all these cool new DC offerings. The stuff you know about now, like the trailer for The Batman, which looks... Fantastic. I was a bit of a doubter, to be perfectly honest with you, in terms of the casting, in terms of the reboot, in terms of what I'd read about it, and the trailer completely turned me around. Looks great to me. I'm really excited about it. Equally excited about the new Batman video game, or rather Bat Family. The upcoming Gotham Knights game, which, among other things, seems to have a really strong focus on Batgirl, in addition to the various Robins, Nightwings, the whole Bat cast. Looks great. Also, Suicide Squad, The Suicide Squad, the next Suicide Squad movie from James Gunn. Looks like it takes every great idea that was thrown out in the original Suicide Squad movie, not to mention Harley Quinn and the fantabulous Birds of Prey. I I can't even say the title. But it looks like it takes all the talents of a Margot Robbie that were squandered in what were two pretty poor movies as well as the brilliant concept and characters available to a franchise like Suicide Squad. And look, it's James Gunn. That's a very different animal than a David Goyer. He's given a lot more free reign. And, you know, to Goyer's defense, I guess, it's not just that he's a less talented director and screenwriter than James Gunn, although he is. He was also put under all kinds of awful constraints by DC corporate. I think everyone involved learned a big lesson, and James Gunn just brings the magic, brings the heat. He clearly sees what is fun and great and exciting and wild about Suicide Squad, and in this sort of semi-reboot, it looks like he's going to redeem the franchise, which I'm very happy about. The Suicide Squad is one of my all-time favorite teams. It's been one of my all-time favorite comics. Not so much the more recent iterations in the last decade or so, but... The version we read in the 80s into the 90s, 
earlier iterations of Suicide Squad and Task Force X going back to like the 60s. It's an amazing concept. It's, you know, the Dirty Dozen in comic book form with these oversized personalities, bombastic superpowers, destructive bombs to keep the rogues from going rogue. It's great. It looks fantastic. So not only does the Suicide Squad look like a great movie, but there's, once again, a tie-in video game, Suicide Squad Killed the Justice League, which looks phenomenal. Just looks amazing. It's going to be available on all the next-gen consoles, PS5, the new Xbox, and, of course, for PCs, which continue to upgrade and have better graphics, more RAM capabilities, so that they'll be able to handle a game that looks as awesome as this game does. So just tons of news from DC Fandom that I actually would have really liked to cover. But bottom line is I was tied up. Now I'm back. And again, there's some news that I don't feel great about reporting. It's very, very sad that on Friday, August 28th, we lost actor Chadwick Boseman at age 43. That is heartbreaking. Boseman, of course, is going to be known to you, if nothing else, as the Black Panther a role he played with such verve, such inspiring talent, such fire. But he was actually a really prolific actor, even though he started pretty late in his life, late enough that there was a lot we could have hoped to see from him. He was amazing in Get On Up as James Brown. He was great in 21 Bridges. I loved him in Spike Lee's The Five Bloods. And he was in, I believe, four Marvel movies, making his premiere in Captain America Civil War, then, of course, Black Panther, and appearing in both Avengers Infinity War and Endgame. And then I remember maybe a month, month and a half ago, TMZ, one of those websites, posted a photo of Bozeman saying that they were very concerned for his health and that he posted a photo of himself to Instagram looking very thin. And he did indeed look quite thin, quite gaunt, disturbing. But Bozeman, who after all, this is none of our business, said, listen, I'm losing weight for a role. That's not at all uncommon. Christian Bale, for instance, has looked a far sight thinner than Bozeman did in that photo. You ever see The Machinist? He looked emaciated. So losing and gaining weight for roles is not uncommon. It's not super healthy if you overdo it, but that's not the point. The point is that Bozeman has been struggling with colon cancer ever since 2016. So that means, among other things, every Marvel movie we've seen him in, he's not just been performing amazingly. He's not just been doing incredible action sequences, showing off a wide range of emotion, acting his heart out. He's been fighting an internal battle with cancer, again, dating back to Marvel Civil War. He was fighting that fight when we saw him in Spike Lee's Defy Bloods. He's been fighting that fight, and he lost. 43 is a horribly young age to die. With everything going for him, an amazing career, bucket loads of talent, it's very heartbreaking and a reminder. This is not the most glamorous PSA in the world, but guys, this thing is actually more rampant than people talk about. So getting checked is maybe the least fun thing in the world, but get checked for colon cancer because it's completely preventable. You can catch it at an early stage. I don't know that Bozeman didn't do that, by the way. It can also come on, be monstrous from the first onset, and ravage you from the inside out. You can discover it early and still not beat it, but you get a really good advantage. You're much better equipped to survive the battle if you catch it early, if you've got a good doctor. And yeah, it's not pleasant, it's not fun, it's not glamorous, it's not fun to talk about, but holy man, 43 years old with everything going for him. An incredible actor whose best work was probably yet to come. Rest in power and my sympathies and sorrow and best wishes to all of his friends, family, people like us, his fans, we've all lost something. And just for the record, not trying to politicize anything, but Chadwick Boseman's last tweet before he died was supporting Democratic VP nominee Kamala Harris. He wrote, yes, Kamala Harris, three claps, hashtag when we all vote, hashtag vote 2020. That is not to in any way capitalize on this tragic death, try to make propaganda out of it. I'm just saying, FYI, that was his last tweet. 
And it's just an unbelievably sad development. Pivoting away from that before I get overly morose, because that's heartbreaking. I did want to talk about Keanu Reeves, who is likely to live forever. I mean, he's 55 now. Looks exactly the same as he did 21 years ago doing The Matrix. And yes, Bill and Ted in particular uses de-aging and pro-aging technology and CGI, but like I've seen the guy on the street. I've seen him in candid photos. He's aging eerily well, as is Alex Winter. But before I talk about Bill and Ted Face the Music, which I've seen and I did like a lot, a bit of news that we all kind of knew was confirmed a couple of days ago. Because after all, they are talking about recasting the X-Men as Fox parts with that license. After one last terrible X-Men movie, by the way, hit screens this weekend. The New Mutants, which I'm not even going to discuss. If you want my opinion on it, don't waste a second of your time. Don't waste a penny of your money. Don't go into a movie theater, which is the only way to see this movie, which is an incredibly irresponsible way to release a film. Movie theaters are about the best way you can get coronavirus. And to risk that for this god-awful garbage movie, I mean, you may as well piss on an electric fence. There's just no stupider way to risk your life. But that said, the X-Men are now being absorbed into Marvel. They're going to be part of the MCU. There's going to be a complete relaunch, new introduction of mutants in general into the MCU, and from there, casting of the X-Men. And turns out, shock and awe, who would have known? Keanu Reeves really wanted to play Wolverine this whole time. He was bummed when he lost the role to Hugh Jackman. Every time he saw the X-Men, he was a big X-Men fan, still is. And now his name is being tossed about, not very seriously, as a potential new Wolverine. It wouldn't work. He knows it wouldn't work. He knows that his opportunity just didn't materialize because he's 55. If he were to be cast today, maybe he would appear in his first movie as Wolverine at age 57, 58, if we're lucky. And these are franchises that are designed to last a decade or more. We need a pretty young Wolverine. We need a guy who's not 55. Again, despite Keanu's seemingly ageless demeanor, he's too old. He knows it. He said it. He admits, as if it were ever in doubt, that he would have loved to have played the role. But also that, you know, John Wick is one thing. He's already got three of those movies under his belt. It's going to wrap up pretty soon. Ditto The Matrix 4. It's fine. He can return. He's established himself in that role. Just like Bill and Ted. These are characters he introduced himself as when he was young. You can't start playing Wolverine when you're getting close to 60. So that is not going to happen. But as I said, The Matrix 4 will happen. John Wick 4 will happen. And Bill and Ted Face the Music was released this weekend. And unlike New Mutants, it was released also on VOD, which is the only sane, responsible way to release a movie these days. If you want to make it also available in movie theaters, that's fine. But you can't be playing around with your customers' actual health, safety, and threat to their lives. This is not a time to be playing, well, this movie's so great. You got to go see it in a theater, this awful YA version of New Mutants. I, I remain stunned by every decision to do with New Mutants. But Bill and Ted Face the Music is so much fun. Just exactly what we need in this dire time in which we're all so stressed out, in which everything is hyper-politicized and stressful, in which fear is everywhere. Fear, division, paranoia. Very little in the way of fun, goofy, not taking anything too seriously. Like, if ever we needed this new Bill and Ted movie, the time is now. With the election coming up, with the virus ravaging the world, and in in particular, the USA. What better time to sit home and watch Bill and Ted on the big screen? And yes, to have fun with the idea that these characters and the actors playing them sort of defy age just as they defy our political infighting and escalating danger and anger and tension, just as they defy life suddenly becoming overly stressful between this election, this fear and inability to function brought about by a global pandemic, 
this really made me believe in the magic of movies again. And it's been a while. And it's not because it was the best movie in the world. It's certainly not bogus. And it's maybe not even the most excellent version of Bill and Ted. But it is the movie we need right now. It is such a joy to watch. Although, admittedly, the theme of the movie is that all of reality and all of space-time is at stake, in addition to the need for a song to bring the world together. So, sure, there's a little bit of tension above this much greater theme, much more fun theme, of uniting the world. What a concept right now. Uniting the world through song. That is what Bill and Ted are tasked with doing. And then, yes, in addition to that, if they should fail to unite the world through song then all of reality, all of quantum realities, every reality is going to collapse. And we see this all throughout the movie in the form of what they call the great unraveling as characters throughout history pop out of where they're meant to be. Participants from pivotal historical or allegedly historical events like The Last Supper, for instance, are displaced, removed from those events and pop up in other periods of history. It's a big space-time disaster. People are popping out of the past and appearing in the present, the future. People from the future are appearing in the past. There's a whole lot of Back to the Future style chaos going on, but with a unique Bill and Ted spin. And it's all because Bill and Ted, well, they're in their 50s. They went back in time. They faced death. They married their bodacious wives from the 15th century. They've got these beautiful daughters, Billy and Thea. You can probably guess whose daughter belongs to which character but they haven't come anywhere near uniting the world. Their musical career has been stagnant for 25 years. They're reduced to playing weddings. Worst of all, a wedding for Missy, who having first been married to Bill's dad, then Ted's dad, is now marrying Ted's brother, making for a very dysfunctional, messed up, awful family tree, which alone should be breaking the fabric of space-time. But no, that's not the real issue. They are playing what they hope might be their song, which finally unites the world, which has been their sole mission these last two and a half decades. And it's awful. It's got theremin. It's got bagpipes. It's got vocal impersonations of didgeridoos. It's got a whole bunch of weird drums. It's not good. Not fun. It's a valiant effort, but they're reaching. You know when you've run out of ideas and you just try every crazy, awful combination, thinking "Mm, maybe it's this? That's the stage of their lives which they've reached. Ted's father continues to believe that they're crazy, that everything about them is a lie, that their wives are not from the 15th century. He pities their wives as the only members of the family, households which actually have jobs. Bill and Ted aren't employed. Billy and Thea aren't employed. They're all chasing this crazy dream of a song to unite the world while the wives languish, watching their husbands become older losers, listening to increasingly unbearable music, and Ted's father hits them where it hurts. And it's not long, in fact, before the wives ask for couples counseling, which goes very strangely because Bill and Ted both think couples counseling means you bring a couple of couples. So this poor therapist is left there with Four people in her office. You know, we both really love both you guys. You know, Bill and Ted, it's sweet that they're inseparable. But it's not doing great things for either one's marriage. That Bill and Ted's marriage are not separate. We got our wives. It's not Bill and Joanna. It's not Ted and Elizabeth. It's Bill and Ted and Joanna and Elizabeth. And the women who had a lot to deal with coming from the 15th century. They understand that they're owed better than this, that their lives should be better than this, that they shouldn't be supporting their deadbeat loser husbands. No offense. I love Bill and Ted, but that is where things are at when this movie begins. So I'm not going to be giving out a lot of spoilers here, or really any, in regards to what happens to their relationship with their wives, although it's very funny, or how or if they unite the world, or how it becomes so serious that it's not just about uniting the world through song, but saving all of quantum reality. I'm not going to tell you if they succeed. I'm not going to tell you how they do or don't do so. I will only say that it's an hour and a half, perfect movie length time of genuine fun, of getting back together with these 
I mean, it feels like putting on a comfortable old pair of shoes or getting back together with a couple of really good friends. It's been 25 years, but Bill and Ted are still Bill and Ted. Keanu Reeves and Alex Winter still embody these characters so humorously, so sweetly and earnestly, and in just so funny a manner. And God love them if they aren't just the most earnest, try hard. I mean, yeah, the language is very Wayne's world, of course. Still, it's all about bogus and excellent and audacious and stuff like that. And thank God for that. It just takes you out of this awful high stakes world we're all living in. And yes, gives you some sort of silly movie stakes. But again, escapism is so hard to come by. Even like goofy movies these days tend to involve so much unnecessary, extraneous plots that are meant to make you care, but just sort of agitate or annoy you, take you away from the fun. This is a very, very well executed, clear concept, three act comedy action movie. And it revisits the entire Bill and Ted universe from the aforementioned family members to the history of Missy and everyone she's married and will continue to marry in the future to death from, of course, Bill and Ted's bogus journey, who makes a return along with new characters like Rufus's daughter, Kelly, played brilliantly and humorously by Kristen Schaal. And yeah, we do get to see Rufus again via a hologram. And it's this bittersweet, sad moment that reminds us of yet another great we lost, George Carlin. It's a reminder of the mark he made on this movie franchise and about what has always made it so great. And yeah, I mean, I'll be honest, I got a little bit teary seeing him again. But his spirit, that of George Carlin, and the message of Rufus about how important, necessary, and realistic it is that Bill and Ted can, will, and must unite the world via song. It's really, really sweet, and it's a family movie. Again, they've got these excellent daughters, Billy and Thea. They play a much bigger role than you would suspect when you first meet them at the opening of this movie. They turn out to be, as you would hope of your kids, the hope for the future. It's about as happy and sweet of an ending as you could imagine in a movie right now. It closes in a way that manages to comment on the world we're living in right now and how we can perhaps do better at getting through it without losing our minds, staying connected and together and keeping friendships alive and vibrant, staying a part of the greater world even as you are hopefully doing your best to isolate a little bit. We need to minimize, I hate to say it, but you know, this is a global pandemic. That means spending a lot of time with a disrupted life, not getting to go where you necessarily want to go at any given time or be with physically in person people you want to be with. Not necessarily because you're being paranoid or you're afraid of facing the world, although you should be cautious and you should be taking care of the people in your life, whether or not you're afraid for yourself, be aware that these are dangerous times. But even assuming you're fine, everyone you know and love is fine. The world is a bit shut down. Us North Americans can't travel to many countries because of how poorly we've handled this whole thing. So like it or not, whatever your ideological or scientific take on this coronavirus is, bottom line is our lives have been disrupted. We can choose to let that make us miserable. We can choose to let that make us be exhausted and cut off from the world, burned out, stop trying, or we can celebrate our triumph the triumph of the human spirit, the unbeatability of life and love, the fact that we're connected in more ways than we think. It's not just physical. And we, after all, have the benefit of technology. There are all these ways in which we can still be together and not isolate. And yeah, I'm sure that this movie was begun. I know that this movie was begun well in advance of the world shutting down because of the virus. And yet, I am positive that if nothing else, the closing credits were shot with an eye toward, hey, things seem pretty bad. We get it. But for those who rock, it's going to be okay. We'll ride this out. It's going to be better. And in the meantime, we can still be okay in the moment. It's 
I may be lionizing this movie a little bit too much because it was just so great for me to just simply sit and have fun for 90 minutes. Revisit these characters and this world and this film franchise I loved so much without feeling in any way stressed out, angered, or scared, or attacked, or as though everything was at stake, even though, again, uniting humanity happens to also be the thing you need to do to keep reality intact. I didn't doubt for a second that Bill and Ted would be able to pull it off. I was as inspired by their ability to do it and the way in which they pulled it off and the people they brought in to support them as I was amused by this really fun, really funny movie. And it is probably the last Bill and Ted film. I don't see there being a Bill and Ted chapter four, but if there were, I'd go see it for sure. But after 25 years, these characters, this story, this mythology holds up and honestly is sweeter, funner, more funny, and more enjoyable than ever. I am going to put that to the test. Sometime this week, my girlfriend and I are going to do a Bill and Ted marathon, but I think that this was the best of the bunch, although obviously it couldn't have been so without all the mythology it builds on from Excellent Adventure and The Bogus Journey, but it is certainly, if you're worried that this is not a great Bill and Ted movie, just stop worrying. Get it on VOD right now and have a wonderful time. Thanks as always. Great to be back, as I said. If you're interested in supporting this podcast, just check out the links in this episode's description. There are links to my PayPal if you want to make any donation of any size. You've got no obligation to do so. If you do decide to make a donation, you're not obligated to make recurrent payments, anything like that. Just drop in as much as you feel appropriate anytime. Ditto my Patreon account. I'd also love it if you followed me on social media. Links as to how you can do that and subscribe to my subreddit. Those are all in this episode's description as well. I'll talk to you soon.